part of perfectionism is this inability to face that you will make the wrong move. Yeah. And when it's impossible, first of all, you can't totally. be going through yeah. life and not making mistakes. And yeah. it's like when I used to be rock climbing, it's like if you're not falling off, it means you're not trying hard enough. Yeah, exactly. So there is this element of of allowing yourself mm. to feel comfortable with making those mistakes, yeah. but also how they shape you. So yeah. my question is, is what's one mistake that had you not had made it, you wouldn't be where you are today? It felt like a mistake for a long time. And now I'm like, oh no, that wasn't a mistake. Mm. It's to say no to funds when you have zero in your bank mm. account and you have spent all your savings. It's really hard to say, no, I, I don't want to enter in a partnership with this investor because the terms are really not founder friendly and uh, they're a bit aggressive. And fortunately, it happened very early on. It could have killed the startup, but I felt that, that it was a failure, not to to negotiate those terms but there was honestly there was nothing to uh, to negotiate and yeah so that felt for a long time like a mistake mm -hmm. and now in hindsight i feel like ch when sustainability wasn't really something people were interested in i felt like we needed to get people towards other part of the business that attracts them and makes sense like numbers financials uh and, and now it feels like we had to compromise on who we were mm -hmm. and hiding the sustainability mission and making it a lesser part of the proposition felt like it's probably something we needed to embrace more welcome to anatomy of a leader a video podcast that shows you that there are many faces of leadership, that perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist, and that making mistakes or taking detours can often lead to deep insights about your superpowers. My name is Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, and I help ambitious leaders hire the most in-demand, high-potential C-suite talent. Each week, let me take you on a journey to discover what leadership truly is and how you too who can get to the very top. And in the meantime, help us reach 1000 subscribers, hit that red subscribe button below and the bell icon so you don't miss a single episode. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Hasna, Hi. welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, we, we, we had a few chats on Clubhouse, but yes, haven't true. met each other. So really yeah. lovely to have you in my home. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. To be no, here. it's a pleasure. Same. Well, Hasna, you're the founder and CEO of Save Your Wardrobe. Yes. You were also born in Tunisia, from uh, what yes. I've learned today. <laughs> and I'm always really curious about what shapes CEO founders. So mm. I'm curious, what did you dream about when you were growing up? Wow. Yeah, that's a, a great question. But I, I've always been interested in the fashion, taking my mother's clothing, trying to reshape them into new clothing, taking some curtains, like the the whole thing, trying to, to learn skills with my aunt and my grandmother. Um, yeah, so that, that part of the, the fashion industry, the creative part, I was super interested in. I didn't uh, master the skills, unfortunately, so I knew very early on that it might not be a, a sustainable career to go into. But then uh, I went to the the economist and uh, and economics um, side of uh, of my personality, and uh, I've uh, I've really found an interest in the business of fashion, and that's how from bits from here and there from the way I grew up as well that uh, shaped who I am today. Yeah. Hmm. What was your first job? Uh, my first job was with, was with the French embassy in Tunisia. So I was commissioned to write a book, an analysis, financial and economical analysis of the Tunisian market for French company who wants to work uh, in Tunisia. So that was uh, a work of research, of analytics, of gathering interviews, going to people, uh, industrials, and trying to understand how things worked. And then condensating it into a book with examples and uh, highlighting the opportunities for uh, for French companies. Mm. What did you take away from that? I mean, having your 
kind of first working experience doing that? It was a really immersive job, uh, trying to understand how, what's the dynamic in uh, in the Tunisian market. It was also uh, before the revolution, so things were planified so that the economical the economy was plan- planned uh, and so the president would say this is our focus for the next five years now it's different all the, the the actors of several industries are working together and shaping the whole kind of country and uh, for the next five years so what it uh, it's a little bit similar to uh, being in a startup because you have to have a vision for five years Things don't go as planned, unfortunately. That's the only difference. But uh, understanding how the market is going and growing, the consumer side, how that shapes investment as well from uh, foreign countries, that's all of the things that I took away and built uh, CV Wardrobe mm. with. Did you always know that you were going to start a company, or how did that how did that happen? Yeah, actually, I didn't even know I was building a company until uh, until I registered into company's house. <laughs> <laughs> I was working on a business plan. I was seeing identifying a, a problem of overconsumption, people disconnected from uh, their purchases, creating huge amount of waste, and then I was. The more I was working on the problem and finding a solution and pivoting the solution into ways that were uh, appealing for the consumer, that's when I thought, okay, there is something uh, to do there. And, uh, and someone labeled me as a, an, uh, as a founder, CEO, working on a, on a startup. So I was like, okay, that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you, you don't realize, especially in the beginning when you're all by yourself, uh, until you scale the team, you're very solo and you're working on uh, on something. Mm. Actually, this is the part that really fascinates me, the sort of the early stages of a startup yeah. where you really have to do so many things and have to wear so many hats. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how did you... Is it something, were you expecting that to be that way when, when you first started out? Or like, what surprised you most about the early stages? What surprised me, so I was hearing a lot of, we need to raise funds, we need to have this and that. And what surprised me is what we can do with less. Because I wasn't aware of the whole thing uh, about it, um, I took the, the things really one step at a time, and f- building the 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 value of Save Your Wardrobe through uh, just posts to start with, and trying to understand how people reacted to those posts. This was even before uh, registering the company, just trying to understand where and what made the the consumers uh, change their minds. About consumption, and uh, and then uh, um, understood as well the stakeholders who were my stakeholders, so the brands, the retailers, the investors, and um, what also surprised me is that when I went to to, to p- pitch Savior Wardrobe and the the importance of circularity, circular economy principles. Not everybody was interested because I thought the sustainability is so important back in 2017. To me, it was important. Um, but to other people, they were like, okay, this is actually just a check, something we need to, to, uh, uh, to check mark in, uh, in our website, but nothing more. And now I'm really happy that the conversation is, uh, is moving to a bigger, uh, to a bigger scale and mm. a bigger. Do you think that's changed? Uh, some, some of the players are really interested and, uh, committed to sustainability. Uh, the scale of it is still, uh, small, relatively small, but bigger than what it used to be. Mm. Yeah. What do you think in is- the fashion industry? Because, mm-hmm. uh, for the other industries like automobile, uh, banking or whatever, the, the, that was important from, from the, the, the essence. Yeah. Mm. And what, why do you think the conversation is changing? What do you think is I think is impacting that? Uh, f- similarly to to all the industries, when the consumer is starting to 
to to push for it. There is a market a market pull. That's when the brands are okay. We need to do something. We can't be left behind. We can't lag on that. And uh, I think the pandemic helped people understand that it's not sustainable to continue consuming the way we the way we are, especially in uh, Western countries. So I think that's what brought brands aware of uh, the of why it's really important to start doing things and not just talk about it. Mm. Yes, that's true and I think this is the the big skill of the entrepreneur yeah. is the ability to have an idea but then to actually make that happen. Exactly. And yeah. to make it real rather than just to sort of discuss it. Exactly. Yeah. Talking about other surprises, I mean with regards to kind of early stages and you're talking about not sort of investors not necessarily or other people not taking it seriously what surprised you most about yourself I mean any kind of skills or qualities that you didn't think you had all of a sudden coming out yeah resilience I didn't think I would be this resilient I didn't think that I could push my boundaries always a little bit further. Uh, and yeah, it started really early in the, in the, the startup journey to, uh, how to take no's. So in the beginning, it would devastate me if someone says, no, I'm not interested. And then I was starting to think, okay, they said no, but why? And then I'm digging and understanding. Maybe I need to to, to change things. How can I make the proposition differently? How can I build things to make them more scalable and reach a wider number of people? So that helped me build myself as well, not just the the, the company. So those surprises or hiccups during the the earlier stages of the startup are not just there to to be an obstacle, but it's a way actually uh, to to learn from yourself and to to push yourself a little bit further because otherwise you would stagnate. And uh, yeah, Mm. that was something I I was surprised to know about myself. Entrepreneurs put themselves into situations which you didn't necessarily (laughs) anticipate. True. And you have to kind of go with the flow and, you know, go with the blows. It's and be super and, and creative react. on solving yeah. problems with very few uh, funds and uh, little funds. So uh, that was something uh, I was surprised to, to, to be able to do. Mm. Uh, yeah. You said earlier about having few resources, but being able to be creative with that. Yeah. Do you think this is important for a startup? Do you think it's almost better to be so constrained in terms of what you have to try to be creative or is that a hurdle that just you just have to overcome like what are your thoughts on that no i think where you have limited resources that's where you can show your full potential on making the most of that little thing and it's also Coming back to the sustainability issue is that how can we make sure that we use the resources we have, the boundary, the planet boundaries that are existing into making, into adding values to things we, we make and building wealth. So that's also something related to it, not only from the startup uh, perspective, but also as a larger scale, as you take a step back. And, uh, and I feel like it's something that you need to learn and to capture in, in order to create uh, value. Otherwise, you are a subject to, oh, I don't have any funds, so I can't do that. Uh, so I'm blocked. It's always the... It's for sure easier when you have the means to your uh, to your ambitions, but when you cannot meet that necessity, you have to find other ways. You have to be creative and contourn the, the, the issue. Mm. What's the hardest thing about being a founder, do you think? That's something, taking things too personally. That's something that you have to separate the startup, the the project or whatever you are building from yourself. And if something fails within the startup, it doesn't mean that you have failed personally. So that was something that I had to learn uh, very early on. Otherwise, it would consume me and make me less being able to react or to actually not to be proactive uh, and facing some of the challenges. Mm. When did you realize that was happening? Uh, it was the first investor who said no, and I felt like it was uh, a failure on my side because I wasn't able to convince them. 
but actually I've realized that investors are very different. It's like dating, maybe, because not everyone are looking for the same things. And when you find the perfect match, it's where you are able to build trust with the, the, that investor. And that also means that if they didn't say no because they are not believing in the, 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 the startup, the project, but it's not just what they are looking for. Mm. So, so not taking it personally was a big, big learning for me. I think it's so hard, though, especially for entrepreneurs or anyone who's really passionate about what they do to yeah. not have that as part of their identity. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, you're saying about having two entities, about having, you know, your project and there's you. Yeah. To some extent, I I mean, I know that I fall into the category where it's really difficult to separate that. Yeah. And to have that ability to sort of step back and at least not take that personally definitely yeah. is useful because then you can kind of avoid having those down moments yeah. when, which is so often can sort of consume you exactly and not be able to continue yeah. doing what you're yeah. doing it sounds easy now but back then it was <laughs> <laughs> it was really difficult uh, what helped yeah. you to get better at that just distancing myself and uh, thinking as well, okay, this didn't work. What else can work? Mm -hmm. So this surely cannot be the only way to get to my, uh, to, 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 my, um, to where I want to go. So what are the other options? How can I? And it would only mean as well that it's going to get slower and not impossible. That's also helped me take it a step back, breathe a little bit, and then, okay, what are my other options? Mm -hmm. What can I do to overcome this uh, challenge? Uh, what are the, uh, the the people, other people that can help? And all of that helped, uh, helped me get that, okay, we are two en separate entities. Uh, if this fails, it doesn't mean that I'm, uh, that it's set in stone and never work. It means that I have to find other ways to make mm -hmm. it work mm. so that's something i've learned uh, along the way <laughs> and it's a good thing because now i'm teaching my children some of my findings and uh and that's, that's also uh, a good uh, a good experience to uh resilience. to learn from yeah, yeah. The resilience exactly and what a great start as well for the children that you know you're already yeah. having that in your mind that you want to pass on those lessons yeah. just make things much easier for them yeah i think one of the first words and i'm not really proud of that but my son first one of the first words was term sheet <laughs> 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 I remember really the day he pronounced that. I was just at like two, yeah, two maybe less than two and a half, and I'm like, oh, I need to. <laughs> got a budding <laughs> entrepreneur. Well, it's either that, or they're going to completely yeah. not want to do that. It yeah. depends on which, you know, which how far you push it, I suppose. But um, that's so funny. Well, talking about family, you also yeah. work with your husband, so he's yes. he's your partner in the yeah. business as well. What's yeah. that like? How does it? You know, what's it like to work together? Well, it, so when I started thinking about this, he was back then digitalizing already the media, uh, journals, press. So making them available in uh, the iPad. So as as soon as the first iPad was released, he was working on that. And so he was already doing things and it was very convenient for me to ask him questions. So I need to do this. What are the, the tech ways to do that? So, and as I was building my, uh, my idea for CV Wardrobe, he, he was involved from day one because he was uh, answering those questions and he was kind of mentoring the, the start because he was also in a startup. And so he was was kind of mentoring me on how to build a startup. And then he saw that there was a big opportunity happening in that space. And he was very attracted to the challenge because the fashion industry is very slow to adapt uh, mm -hmm. to technologies. So he took it as a, a challenge and he wanted to uh, to get involved. And when I raised my first round of investment and he was able to leave his work at Barclays, he joined the startup full time with me. And, uh, and then he built the team. He built the first um, MVP of uh, Savior Wardrobe. And uh, and that's how it gradually went. It wasn't easy, especially for the family to accept that we are working together. But then what is convenient is that he understands the hectic, well, what it used to be a hectic schedule, the traveling, the missing uh, a lot of things to build the startup, to meet people, 
to go to into incubators. So he was very understanding on that side. And he was also getting that kind of uh, helping me with the little one and taking care of him when I was away uh, for, for several weeks. Um, so that was quite convenient and uh, super helpful. Um, and yeah, now as the team is growing, it's another... So I think he's my co-founder first and then my husband from, uh, yeah, <laughs> because we are working together and during the pandemic, we were trying to scale the project, we're launching it and uh, launching the, the startup. And so we were working the, the, as we were like awake, we were working. So he, uh, he took the, the, the position of co-founder more than the husband part. <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't feel like it's a challenge, but it can be when it comes to parenting. So my, the little one told us, so that I have a schedule with you, for you. From nine to five, you're allowed to work. After I go to bed, you are allowed to do whatever you want. But from five to eight, you are with me. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Mm -hmm. So that's when we realized that work is taking a little bit too much of our time. And that imbalance between life and work was uh, mm -hmm. affecting the little one. But yeah, if it wasn't for the pandemic, we wouldn't have uh, realized that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think pandemic is teaching us a lot yeah. of... A lot lot of lessons about relationships yeah, and totally. how we relate to other people yeah. and who we like to spend time contact, with and who connect. we don't. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah so do you think talking about creating schedules do you think that was helpful in terms of oh, yeah. creating a balance yeah, yeah. yeah. when the this, the pandemic hit at the beginning, we understood that the team needed those kind of, even though everything was remotely done and digitally and no more face-to-face -face meeting, we understood that we needed to bring that sense of getting in physical environment towards digital. So we are, were already using Slack back then, back when we were in physical offices. And, and then we said we need to schedule the week in ways that the whole teams were meeting in the morning, in the afternoon. We have uh, daily stand-ups with the product, with the tech team, and then making sure that the squads of uh, teams were meeting together as well. And, uh, and yeah, so that from the first week, we understood that we needed to put some sense of schedule, but also organization, uh, so that the team were, weren't feeling too lost or uh, yeah so that's incredibly important especially when hiring junior or hiring other people who are only uh, used to working in a physical environment yeah I mean the whole of the working environment has changed yeah, when completely. you know especially if when you're working from home and you don't have a chance to go somewhere or there is you know no opportunity to do that and how do you create structure for yourself I think that's incredibly hard yeah. I think for companies that's a huge challenge to mm. work out what exactly yeah. needs to you know it's to happen to kind yeah. of engage people and to give them the freedom but at the same time some kind of a guidance yeah. Yeah. and the other challenge for the team I would say and some of them are incredibly dedicated but we found ourselves the, uh, that we needed to tell them stop and you need mm -hmm. to rest you need to cut this is the work day because if they would follow our pace they would work 24 hours <laughs> seven, and that's not healthy and mm -hmm. that's not what we want them to do but I remember we need to let them know that you shouldn't work late you shouldn't work in the weekend you should really uh, care for your mental health care for yourself especially when uh, at a time where it's super scary outside and uh, and you find yourself locked uh, at home and what can you do uh, you just keep working and yeah some some of the team members we had to uh, to help them just uh, take it easy mm. it's a, it's a marathon not a sprint so you have to build things so that they last or they are sustainable for you as a, as an individual mm. and a team member as well it's it's hard as well in terms of you know first of all you need to manage yourself yeah. understand yourself <laughs> and then to be able to also explain it to the rest of the team yeah exactly but when it comes to finding the right people and hiring, I mean, mm -hmm. what what's, you know, what I suppose, what tips can you give or what do you find mm -hmm. the most challenging? Like what's, you know, keeps you awake at night and yeah. I, 
with Mahdi, we want to really that the, uh, we want the team to feel like they are part of a mission and part of a, and not just employees or just here to, to, to do what we ask them to do. We really want to be there to help them build their career and feel like they are heard and part of something and not just following us. So from the first thing we did is to talk to students and to do partnerships with universities, whether here in London or in Tunisia, and make sure that they, when they join Save Your Wardrobe, they are building their personal the personally and also professionally and so when we talk to people we want to make sure that they understand that part and it's not just it's not it sounds like it's easy but some people are just there to check uh, that they need to 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 fill that uh, that requirement from their school and so to hire talent what we did is to look for them early on why they are still uh, in school looking for an internship and uh, building the relationship with them uh, as we go and then trying to make sure that they are building themselves within the company as well. So one of our first team member, she joined as an intern. Her mission was to uh, to communicate about Save Your Wardrobe and uh, handle social media. And now two years later or three years later she's handling the product she's a product lead so she's um, talking uh, uh, she's in between the product team and the tech team in Tunisia and she has a big uh, responsibility to make sure that everything is communicated really well and she's also the connection with the users another team member she joined as well as an intern and now she's leading the whole partnerships with brands and retailers and she's crucial to the company and in Tunisia, people are as well uh, growing and understanding. Some of them thought that they needed to go um, outside of the country to really be able to fulfill themselves. But they found out that there are some companies in Tunisia that will, uh, and uh, Savior Wardrobe will help them into building their skills and uh, understand what are the challenges they need to, and how to overcome some of the challenges. So I'm, I'm really proud that we are able to support the team members into building. And even when they leave, we feel like super proud that uh, they left for something bigger and mm -hmm. not just for another company that they will do the same. And uh, yeah, so that uh, makes us proud. And uh, yeah, so that's how we hire our team members. And then now the next challenge is to hire more senior individuals and uh, yeah. That's mm. the next step to the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> What's been the hardest part about doing that? Hiring the most senior people, the most senior mm -hmm. salary because they, <laughs> they yeah. need to be paid uh, a, a lot more. And so that's something that we will have to take into account in our next uh, fundraise. Yeah. So attracting the people with their, those who have the connection network and so on. At the moment, they are part of our advisory. Um, they are our advisors. They help us build and understand the market as well. Um, but yeah, next step is to uh, to have them on the, the payroll. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, as at each stage, the company evolves and changes. And as a founder, you're having to deal with different situations and the business grows. Yeah, exactly. And um, and and who you need to become changes. Yeah. Do you feel? My God, let me see if I can phrase this question. Like, <laughs> how do you think you are different now to from when you started? Oh, a completely different. Huh? Yeah. I was feel like I was uh, a child, and now uh, even though I was uh, I'm an adult, it's uh, you learn a lot, and it's people you learn about how to be even more um, having that empathy to to understand how things work uh, yeah and you learn from others you learn from yourself as well you learn how um, challenges can shape you for the better or the worse you discover things that you don't like about yourself you discover things that you really like about yourself and try to build on those um, you discover as well how you are perceived from uh, from an outside point of view and that helps you build 
and create value uh, for yourself. So that was, that's not as easy as I make it sound, but it's a great experience being a founder and also just building a startup and building a proposition and uh, learning as well from, uh, from people who are using the app and building a value and improving it and uh, hearing the bad as well as the good, trying to make sense of things. And, uh, and yeah, so that's, uh, uh, so many things that makes me different Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I really value the experience what do you wish you learned sooner whenever I pitched Savio Wardrobe and thinking that the market needs that Mm -hmm. and pitching to the brands and retailers who are maybe too early to to understand how the market is going because there are so many politics that it's like having a big ship turn it takes time and it takes a lot of manpower to do that i wish i learned that sooner that it's not about the proposition is the readiness of other uh, players how would you have acted differently at that point i mean what could you have done differently um it's less fr- uh, frustration probably <laughs> yeah <laughs> and more patience mm-hmm. and th- those are probably two of the most valuable things in a startup patience and time because yeah there's this kind of race to, to market being the first being the pioneer being the, the leader and uh, when everybody else is not uh, ready to hear about sustainability or circular models that's when you get a little bit frustrated but Things, something I've learned uh, mm-hmm. now uh, is things will come. If you build them, they will come to you. So mm. that's what we did. We built Save Your Wardrobe. We built a proposition for brands and retailers. And now they, they are mature. It's not about maturity, but it's, they are ready to hear that the, the business, the linear business model is not working anymore. And they are open to hear from other perspectives. Mm-hmm. I always find it, in life, you're always balancing the opposite. And what's interesting that you're saying about, you know, startup, you've got this, on the one hand, this sense of urgency and like racing towards something, but at the same time, like you might be ready and you're kind of going, 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 but then you're kind of, you know, the market needs to kind of catch up, yeah. but, you know, and, and, and the customers need to catch mm-hmm. up. So then there is also the element of patience. So you're always in like balancing these completely yeah. opposing things and how Completely. you deal with that is what determines the success. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm interested in is how strengths can also become weaknesses. Have you experienced something like what's your one strength mm-hmm. that if you overuse it becomes so I thought that being perfectionist was a strength, mm-hmm. but I couldn't be more wrong. Mm-hmm. It's actually one of the worst thing to have. Uh, it's one of my weakness now. It's become something that is overwhelming. And also the dangerous part is that I, I need now to make sure that the team doesn't learn from that. Because if you're a perfectionist and things need to be done in a certain way, it, they never go to uh, to be tested in the market. And um and also it's a test and learn thing and uh, failure makes it better. Mm-hmm. And so now whenever I feel like I'm uh, trying to, to make things perfect, I'm like, no, I need the opposite. Mm-hmm. I need to just ship it, put it in, out out there, just talk about it even mm-hmm. without even building it and see how people react to that. And if it's worth spending time and resources into creating, then yeah, let's go. Uh, yeah, so perfectionism is the worst thing because not only for the product and startup, but also for people around me that will feel the pressure. Mm-hmm. And I understand that being under pressure is uh, something that can create wonderful things. But at the same time, if it's just for the sake of being perfectionist, it's uh, mm. it doesn't work. Yeah. I love the idea of making mistakes yeah. and facing failure because part of perfectionism is this inability to face that you will make the wrong move yeah and when it's impossible first of all you can't be going through life and not making mistakes and it's like when I used to be rock climbing it's like if you're not falling off it means you're not trying hard enough yeah exactly so there is this element of of allowing yourself Mm. to feel comfortable with making those mistakes but also how they shape you so my question is is What's one mistake that had you not had made it, you wouldn't be where you are today? It's not a mistake. 
it felt like a mistake for a long time, and now I'm like, oh no, that wasn't a mistake. Mm-hmm. Is refusing funds from uh, from uh, it was a very hard decision to make mm-hmm. to say no to funds when you have zero in your bank mm-hmm. account and you have spent all your savings. It's really hard to say no. I I don't want to enter in a partnership with this investor because the terms are really not founder friendly and uh, they're a bit aggressive. And fortunately, it happened very early on. It could have killed the startup but i felt that, that it was a failure not to to negotiate those terms but there's was honestly there was nothing to uh, to negotiate and yeah so that felt for a long time like a mistake mm-hmm. and now in hindsight i feel like ch- when sustainability wasn't really something people were interested in i felt like we needed to get people towards other part of the business that attracts them and makes sense like numbers financials uh and uh, and now it feels like we had to compromise on who we were Mm -hmm. and hiding the sustainability mission and making it uh, a a lesser part of the proposition felt like it's probably something we needed to embrace more Mm. this was in uh, 2000 something (laughs) right yeah Mm. and so how Having gone through that, how do you make decisions now when it comes to choosing investors? Alignment with mm-hmm. the, the mission and the market and trust as well. Mm-hmm. So if the investor doesn't trust us as a team, uh, we don't even go for a follow-up meeting. We are still early, so numbers are important, but they can't really tell much. However, having a conversation with the investor and having them understand who we are as a as a founding team but also who we have as a key people in the team is extremely important to have them following that and for the moment what we what we're trying to build so mm. someone that will trust where we are what we are building the mission the vision but also how we are able to pivot if things uh, are not working so this is where we are trying to focus on when we meet new investors. Um, but they also understand that in order to build that, you need to pivot, you need to be adaptable to change the, the trajectory to make sure that you arrive to, uh, to, to the vision that you had in the first mm. place. What does leadership mean to you? That's a great question. And uh, I, I thought about it and I felt like, it depends on who, uh, with who you are. So with the team, leadership means something. Leadership means that you are rolling your sleeve and you are leading uh, by the example and getting things done with them and not just telling them, bossing them around or micromanaging them. When it comes to talking to investors, for example, leadership means that you are leading uh, something in the market. You are leading a topic. You are making sure that the startup or the company is leading something and it's delivering as well. And then leadership, when it comes to people who are using the app, for example, is leading a conversation, leading uh, a topic that they are very close to their heart. And that's why they are joining the communities, because they want someone to lead the sustainability conversation and to deliver that. So I feel like leadership can have different definitions and different aspects, depending on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't talk to my team the same way I would talk to my investors or my uh, the community we are building. So that's where I would say leadership can have different hats and being a a bit of a chameleon. I think what you I think what you're saying is that there are different expectations and different people yeah, different yeah. expectations of the people. So when you're talking to a team, they expect you to, you know, set the vision for the business yeah. and bring them on that journey towards exactly. it. With investors, we're talking about being very passionate and very knowledgeable within the industry and showing to yeah. them that you have the ability to see further into the exactly. future and also to like bring everybody on board to make that happen. And then the customers, it's also getting into their mindset about mm. what needs do they need to have. Yeah. So it's how you communicate and what you exactly. say. It does yeah. change. When it comes to making leadership decisions, you know, regardless of who your audience, so to speak, Mm -hmm. do you have a role model that you have in your mind that you're thinking, oh, what would they do? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, who do you kind of, you know, look to for for leadership? 
advice or decisions? It might sound cheesy, but yeah, first of all, there are some qualities in in lots of people that I like and I get a little bit from everyone. Mm. I love Nathalie Masné, what she did with net very early on when nobody had a website or even e-commerce. She built a whole marketplace. I love people who are trying to change things for the better. But I, f- I look up to my grandmothers mm. and my great-grandmothers because at the time of challenges and they made sure that the family were protected and safe and although they they it's a very patriarch it's a big patriarchy in mm-hmm. Tunisia they were uh, leading their whole families the husbands the, the the male so they weren't afraid of imposing and speaking and leading their the whole family towards whatever they needed to do And I found that extremely fascinated at a time and generation where women usually are put in the back, especially in Tunisia, in a very traditional country. So, yeah, I'm really impressed about uh, about That's them. so interesting. Yeah. What do you think made them different and to be able to, to do that? Yeah, to speak up. And uh, mm. I have no idea. <laughs> and uh, it's very fascinating that mm. they are not scared and not shy to impose themselves. And I feel like We need to learn a little bit from our elders. And uh, it's something that I'm discovering more and more about them. Uh, And yeah, it's fascinating to hear about the history, to hear about all the the kind of things that happened to them and the different wars that they've Mm -hmm. been through. I heard, I don't remember who said this, but it was somebody in a conversation I was having and saying like, women have always been CEOs, she (laughs) said. It's just hasn't necessarily been recognized. And I think completely, you know, the next generation seeing how women have been doing that, yeah. maybe in subtle ways, maybe not so subtle ways, but they have always been, Leaders, you know, in, yeah. in those positions. Yeah. And, you know, whether it comes to leading the household, leading the family, leading businesses you know, as well. So and my businesses. grandmothers are, were not just leading the, the household, they were leading the, mm-hmm. the businesses. So my great grandmother lost her husband really young and he left her with a huge thing to lead. And uh, there were a lot of problems that she needed to solve uh, mm-hmm. as a woman. And uh, she made sure that uh, she did that. And uh, when my parents t- tell me the, her story, I was like, wow, she's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a political uh, Mm -hmm. business thing. So, yeah, I was really impressed that she was able to handle Mm -hmm. from her perspective all of that from home as well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And any misconceptions people may have about you? Oh, that's a good question. probably plenty <laughs> I don't know I'm I'm trying to communicate as much as I can and as transparently as I can so hopefully there are no misconception but probably something that in uh, in the beginning of Save Your Wardrobe as, wom- as a woman trying to uh, raise funds the Save Your Wardrobe was perceived as something really disposable or not uh, essential to, uh, especially by male investors. And so then I had to send my husband, a male figure, to lead the, some of the conversation. But I was preparing him all of the topics that he mm. needed to. Uh, so probably the misconception is that he is leading the, the fundraising while it's just him as a because this whole thing of women raising funds is just uh, I've heard that it's only two percent of funds going to women Mm -hmm. so I'm playing that thing so that I'm uh, I'm Mm. trying to be strategic on that Mm. (laughs) on that I mean on the one hand it's it's creative and you're using the resources that you have but yeah. on the other hand it also makes me really mad that you have to go down that route and yeah, well it was this case mm-hmm. back then and now I'm like if you are with us or without us but the market is moving mm-hmm. in in the way we are and validating the vision that we have and so now I'm like if you are joining the startup and the project and all welcome mm-hmm. if not let's move on to the next person so I'm using him less now <laughs> <laughs> he can concentrate on yeah, the tech part. exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and last question hasna what seems impossible to you now but if you were to oh. achieve this that would change the course of your business 
Uh, uh, good question. Especially that there isn't enough time in a day to uh, to do whatever I need to do. And what seems impossible is also... Uh, <laughs> this is a tricky question because it feels like... As I was saying earlier, I'm taking things one step at a time. Otherwise, it would feel uh, overwhelming. And if I look at a little bit of all the tasks that I need to do, it feels like really impossible. And now we are just thinking about how to, to make sure that the team it aren't overwhelmed because there are so many opportunities at the moment, making sure that we... Yeah, it feels impossible to do everything, but I'm not looking at it at the moment. <laughs> it's a perfectionist yeah. part of you trying to make it all happen yeah. all at the same time. I think it's hard yeah. for everyone, yeah. especially when you like there's opportunity, there's ideas and having to be so focused and to say, no, I'm going to focus on this now. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, this is probably cultural where I'm focusing on in some aspects of the business and ignoring some others. So I'm ignoring all the vanity around Save Your Wardrobe. I'm not ignoring the brand, who the brand should be, but the fact that we need to reach this uh, amount of uh, growth, this amount of things, because that's what some people are expecting. But I'm thinking as well, what if that's not a qualitative growth? What if it's not lead uh, generating revenues what if so i know that a lot of startups are focusing on growth and making sure that they take as much uh, market share as possible i'm starting to learn that it's also something that i need to take into account um while i wasn't looking at that at, at all i was looking at what are the business side and how the business is healthy and ignoring all the vanity metrics and i feel like they they are named vanity metrics for a reason but it seems more and more important to some people now mm. well it's something i, I need again to yeah. balancing yeah balancing opposite ends <laughs> exactly yeah yeah mm. Making things shiny and bright mm. and cute and things where I feel like those resources could be used in a better way to build mm. uh, something valuable. So see, for me also, mm. it's like I'm not a fan of packaging. And I mean that in in its kind of original form, you know, you know, having like, you know, a pair of shoes and a yeah. nice box and, you know, everything. Like I, I think that's, that is, for me, I find that very wasteful. But also when it comes to, you know, you know, presenting yeah. a business, for example. And although I feel like, well, again, energy could be better spent elsewhere. Yeah. But the way that human psychology works is that we want to see the presentation. Yeah. We want to have this. It's part you know, of the experience, the experience. The brand experience. And it's like, how do you have a little bit of that mm -hmm. without sacrificing you yeah. know, what the real business and the real core, you know, is it talking about mm. having a healthy business? Yeah. And that's um, that's a fine find balance to yeah. make mm. it's one of the many challenges mm. <laughs> it's uh the list is so long it goes on mm. and on but yeah the, the healthy thing to do is take things one step at a time otherwise it's overwhelming it feels like impossible to solve it feels like the, the, the it's a non-ending uh thing so Mm. It would be my recommendation for any new founder. <laughs> yes, take it one thing at a time. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I need to pay attention to that myself. <laughs> well, well Hasna, thank you so much. It's Absolute such a pleasure, pleasure. To, thank you to talk to having, you. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed this whole setting. It's really beautiful. Well done. <laughs> and yeah, well done on your series. Congratulations so on so many qualitative speakers and uh uh, guests that you had well, thank you so much pleasure. thank you Hadna. thank you so much for joining us here on anatomy of a leader what did you discover in this episode i'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below and if you haven't already hit that subscribe button and i'll see you next week